Hey, what's going on everybody? Welcome to another tutorial series in which we're finally tackling something else than Unity. Let me explain. As we move uh, towards multiplayer stuff, at one point we might need some other services outside of Unity, such as a database, such as a, a backend somewhere that would help us treat information that is outside of the, the client, right? So the client is there for playing the game, uh, you can also host on there, but if you need to tackle um, storing data on a database and if you need to start interacting with Node.js and maybe a backend server with maybe an API or something like that, um, we need to start introducing some other technologies, not just Unity. So the goal of this very first non-Unity series, which has some Unity in it, is to really just introduce you to two new technology stack, one being Node.js and the other one being uh, Mongo database. So we're going to be using these two, and if you're not familiar with it, just take along. As I like to say, just take along and try to replicate what I'm doing, and eventually you're just going to start picking that up. The goal of this tutorial is to actually create a login system. We don't actually do anything with the login system. We just sign you in. We do some authentication, and and that's it. We don't do OAuth. We just do regular username and um, password authentication. Now this tutorial is really just like an introduction. So if you already know how to do these things, if you already know how to do authentication, this tutorial might not be for you. Here, um, I'm looking to teach three things. Integration with Unity Engine. I'm looking to teach some security practices. And I'm looking to teach, I forgot the third one. Oh yeah, the third one is to do some uh, web requests from Unity to somewhere else. So in this case, our own server. So that's what we'll be tackling. Um, the way I'm going to be doing it is first, the first episode is going to be all about uh, actually putting up our server, right? So we're going to go download Node.js, make sure we have everything we need and just run our server. In the second episode, we're going to go ahead and take the Unity engine and connect to the server we made in the first episode. At that time, the code is not going to look too great. Like there's going to be a lot of security flaw, but the reason there's going to be security flaw is I want to make sure people understand a very basic implementation with plain text password, for example. So we're going to do a bunch of bad practices. And in the third episode, we're going to go through and fix all those security flaws that we've mentioned. And there might be a little bit more to fix, but those are a little bit more advanced. That being said, I hope you guys enjoy this. It's a new thing I'm trying out. So please let me know what you think about that in the comment section down below um, of this video and also all the other videos. If you have any questions, I do invite you to leave them in there as well. All the videos are going to have timestamps on them, as as always. And uh, yeah, really eager to see what you guys think of me not doing Unity for a bit. Um, but it's all in the goal of making something multiplayer, and I hope you guys enjoy. So, I'll see you in the videos. Cheers. Alright guys, I'm back. Welcome to the first video throughout two channels, throughout five years of making videos on YouTube, is the first time I'm going to be showing something else than Unity. And today we're going to be tackling some JavaScript, Node.js, Mongo. We're going to be tackling a lot of new tech that maybe you're not comfortable with, maybe you haven't even ever played with in the past, and maybe you've done nothing else but um, game programming in the past. That's totally fine. But at one point, especially now since we're taking in the direction of making multiplayer game, we have to branch out into different services. We have to branch out into web services, we have to branch out into database services, we have to make sure we expand our horizon. So I went from somebody who really hated doing anything web related to now I use JavaScript pretty much whenever I can. So let's have a look at what we have here. We are going to need a couple of things before we get started. The first thing, of course, is Node.js, and you can get it by going on Google, typing in Node.js. It's on nodejs.org, and you can hit the download link right here. It actually means long-term support, so you want to be downloading something like that. Uh, right now, I am currently on version 14, so that's what I'm using at the moment. Uh, you know, what we're going to be doing uh, doesn't require anything fancy, so to be frank, you could be using a lower version or a higher version. I don't think things are going to change that much. So we have Node.js. I also like to use a terminal like git bash for, um, for having quick access to two things. Uh, first, git, right? So I want to be able to push that somewhere. Having some source control is always useful. We're going to be doing that throughout this mini series. And also, I want to be able to have a terminal that allows me to SSH in another computer. If you don't know what I'm talking about right now is um, eventually at one point, we are going to have another machine somewhere else through maybe a paid service or maybe through a Raspberry Pi that is laying in, in your room somewhere. 
uh, we want to be able to connect to that other machine. So like connecting through remote, uh, for example, uh, through TeamViewer or something like that. But here we want to do it through SSH. It's a secure way to connect to another computer and all you have access to is the shell. So with Git Bash, this terminal window over here, I have access to things I need, such as SSH. I have access to SSH key gen if I want to generate myself a key. Uh, I don't want to do that, no. And of course, I have access to anything Git related. So that is what matters. Make sure you download it. I downloaded it for Windows and that's pretty much it. Once you have Node.js installed and then you also have the git bash install or any other terminal that allows you to do the thing I've mentioned, uh, we're also going to need two different services. One of them is optional. So the one that is optional is a source control uh, that uses git. So here I'm using GitLab. You could be using GitHub uh, or you could be using, I guess, Source3 with Atla Atlassian. I don't know. I'm Well, another git project. Um, and this one is optional. You don't have to save your project as we go. I just like to do it and I'll be doing it on video. That's why I am going to tell you, hey, I'm using Git. Okay, so it's something that I do all the time when I'm making something that isn't Unity related because Unity has their own source control system that I also use. Um, and then on top of that, one that is not optional is the MongoDB. So you're going to be having to host your database somewhere, right? We're going to be creating a, a screen that allows you to log in and keep user information, keep game accounts. And to have that information, you need to store it somewhere. Um, here is where I would store it. I would store it inside of Atlas MongoDB, which is if you go on Google, you can just type in Atlas MongoDB and it should be the first thing that pops up. Yeah, so it's the MongoDB Atlas services. You click start free and you should be headed to the right website. I just sign up with Google, much easier, and then I can create myself a new project. This one is going to be um, login, login tests, and we'll pull that under the name of the channel. What is my preferred language? I don't actually care. Continue. And of course, for us, we're just doing some testing. We're not going live with this, so we're going to create a free cluster, and that's going to allow us to host a couple of uh, data for free, of course. You get to choose what is a provider. I'm going to use Amazon for US East because that's the closest to me. Create the cluster. And then we should be ready for future development. All right, so we're going to leave this one working as we go and create our first folder for the project. So here I have a clean desktop, just made it for you. I'm going to go ahead and right click, create myself a new folder that I'll call. Um, this could be my node backend for my game. Mm. We gotta find a better way. So let's call it login backend. Login is gonna be the name of our project. Why not? All right, so now we have our folder over here. The challenge today is gonna be to actually go inside of that folder, but through the command line. That's the hardest thing we're gonna be doing in this episode. Um, so let's go ahead and boot up our terminal over here. I'm gonna try to zoom in a little bit so you guys can see. So in that terminal, I want to know where I'm at right now. So what I can do is write pw2 for print working directory. I'm currently in my user folder and this is on my desktop. Knowing that, you know, when I'm in my user folder, I have access to desktop. This is exactly the same exact way as going um, over here under my users where so C users and 3k and then I get to this point here. I can also display the list of folders I have at the moment by typing in DIR on the Windows, I believe, and then you get to see all of that. Or you can also type in LS if you're on Linux. Or it's also going to work here as well because Git Bash has that functionality in it as well. So at that point, we can go inside of one folder by typing in CD, and I want to go inside of the desktop folder. Technically, this is a desktop folder. So I type in D. ES and I hit tab, it's going to autocomplete to desktop. And here I am. At that point, I can list everything that is on my desktop. Um, I have a lot of things, you just don't see it because it's on my other screen. But <laughs> my desktop here looks clean, it's actually not clean at all. Uh, but I can find the project login back end. So I'm going to type in CD login and then tab. And here it is. Hit enter. I'm currently in my folder and there's nothing in there. So once we made it to that point, we're going to start writing down some commands just to get the project started. The first thing we'll do is npm initialize. And this stands for 
node package manager initialize. When you have a node, um, a node project, any node.js project, you can type in this command to have the project set up for you. And we're going to do that right now. So npm init. It asked me for the package name. I'm going to leave that on default. Version, leave that on default. Description, backend for the login project. And three point, leave that on default. Test command, default, git, default, keyword, default, author, mic. Um, the license on default. Is this okay? Yes. And now if you've been paying attention, you're going to see that inside of your folder, there is now a new file, a package file. And if we open it up, it looks a little bit like this. So this is your package.json. Every time that you're going to add a new dependency to your project, it's going to be in here. And we'll see that very shortly in the next episode. But right now, this is all you need to have <laughs> at the moment. Now, if you don't plan on doing a source control whatsoever, uh, the video would be over for you, but I do recommend that you keep a source control because it's just good practice, right? If you're here to practice, you should, you should do that. And I'm going to show you how to do that fairly quickly. I am still in my login backend folder. I'm going to type in git initialize. Now with git initialize, we now have the git folder, which is right here. And this is a hidden folder. Maybe you don't even see it actually because it is hidden. That's okay. We keep it that way. It doesn't need to be shown uh, because everything that changes within the project can be seen by doing a git status. And here you're going to see that the untracked file, so everything that changed is actually just the package adjacent. So within this folder, what has been uh, different from the version we have on the web, which we technically don't have, the only changes that happen is the package.json. Now we are going to go ahead, go under a git um, service, whether that is GitHub, GitLab, and we're going to go ahead and create ourselves a project for this project, actually. So I'm going to go back here under my cluster. My cluster is now created, by the way. I'm going to go under my GitLab, create myself a new project, a blank project, actually, and this is going to be the login backend. I don't need to have project description. This one is going to be on private until we're actually done with the project. Or should it be? Yeah, it's going to be on public right away. So this is the login backend for the test project for the login project, right? It's a really bad description. Um, here you also have some more information on how to actually commit this. As you can see, we are pushing an existing folder because we already made that folder. We went inside of that folder by doing a CD. So we navigated towards that folder. We did a git initialize. Now we're at the part where we have to add a remote. So we're going to copy this over actually. So git remote add origin and then the link of this project. So if I am to do it in another way, in case you can't copy for some reason, you can go ahead and do git. What was it already? Remote add origin and then the link. Where do you find the link? You find the link right here. When you hit clone, you can see clone with SSH. It actually gives you a link. So I'm going to grab this through clipboard, go back in my uh, git bash, and then here, git remote add origin, hit enter. And at that point, we are now connected with the project. All we have to do is like a normal push. So we first add the files that we want to add, we create a commit, and then we push like so. So let's see, git status, what has changed? Well, only the package.json has changed at the moment. So we can do git add dot, which means everything that has changed, we're going to add it to the change list. Git commit slash m for message. This is the initial commit. And finally, git push slash u origin main. Failed to push some riff. Okay, so what happened here? Okay, so it turns out that this command here didn't work. The push origin main, and I'm wondering, is it because my branch is actually called master here? So I'm gonna go back to my command that I just wrote. And to do that, I'll just hit the up arrow key and the down arrow key. They're gonna allow you to travel uh, travel through uh, the thing that you wrote earlier. So I can go far back if I wish, but let me go back to the 
push origin main. Instead of pushing an origin main, I'm going to push origin master, see if that works. And it seems like it did. So now that we have this confirmation message, we create a new branch, we're going to hit F5 to see the refresh. And this is our brand new project pushed one minute ago, a couple of seconds ago, actually. And here it is. So we now have a cluster ready for our database. We now have a backend, which will contain our project. And finally, we have a project that is ready to be worked on on Node.js. So we've did the initial setup. There is one last thing that I invite you to do, and that is, didn't do it earlier because that is to grab your preferred IDE. So your preferred developing environment. Personally, when I made, uh, when I started coding for JavaScript, I was only using Sublime. So Sublime is this text editor here, and you can put it under JavaScript and you know, you can start coding uh, and it gives you a little bit of intelligence. That's totally fine. But at one point I wanted to have more and that thing is the Visual Studio Code. Well, this ain't Visual Studio Community Edition, but it's Visual Studio Code. And one, one cool thing about it is that you can actually download that on Mac OS as well. So if you, if you have a Mac, then you can actually download Visual Studio Code and here we can code, as you can see here, we have the file explorer as we, as we do for, well, right now we only have one file, so it's kind of hard to see. Um, but we have a file explorer. If I am to open it in the proper folder, let me do that really quick. Yep. Here it is. We have the file explorer. We also have a, um, a changes list. So once we hook up our Git to this, we're going to be able to see what has changed. We're going to be able to see version in the past. And it's just a very good editor and it also has a built-in terminal personally i don't use that but you could technically just come here and uh, do the exact same thing as we've done in git bash so with that being said if you're interested in getting visual studio code type it in in google first link of course um it's right here and it's from of course the same people who've made visual studio community edition so I do invite you to get this one. It's fairly cool. You can also have plugin if you wish, and I use it for a lot of things. Okay. And with that being said, we are pretty much done with the first episode in which we set up our environment for the development of the backend. Uh, we're going to keep on going in that optic, keep on developing the backend until we're pretty much done. And then we're going to move on to Unity and create the front end over there. So we're kind of swapping things around because usually I would do Unity first and then I would go into the backend. But this time around, I want to do the backend first and go into Unity. Let me know if you prefer that. Or I think they're not going to be intertwined too much until we reach to a certain point. So you could start with the Unity one if you wish as well. That being said, let's wrap it up for today and I'll see you fairly soon. Cheers. Welcome back guys. Welcome to the second video on the backend side. Last time we created ourselves a new project. We made sure to initialize it on GitLab. We also uh, made sure to create ourselves a new cluster on the MongoDB website. Today we're going to be actually hosting things on, on, on the locals. We're going to be using Express, which is a package offered by uh, I, I don't know exactly who makes Express, but basically it's a it's a package that allows you to host a, uh, you could say a website to make it very simple. You could host a website on your computer. So we are going to do that right now. And um, we're going to not write a lot of code today, but the code we're going to be writing is something you have to understand. So we're going to go very, very slowly and make sure everything is understood. Now, let me just clear up what I've done earlier. Um, I am currently on my login backend. As you can see here, if I do a print working directory, I am in the right folder. If you're not in the right folder, make sure you navigate to it using um, CD. By the way, if you hit CD dot dot, it's going to bump you one folder prior. So right now I'm on my desktop, as you guys can see, and I'm going to go on my login backend. And here I am. So inside of here, um, one neat command that you can do if you have uh, installed Visual Studio Code, which is what I'm running in the background here, you can actually type in code dot, and this is going to open up the Visual Studio Code in that folder. And now I just did it on my other screen. Here it is. So what we're going to be looking to do today is actually run some code, some JavaScript code. And I'm going to go inside of my login backend folder, right click, create myself a new file that I'll call server.js. It's a JavaScript file, so I type in .js at the end. It's very important you do that here because, for example, 
if you do something.txt, it's gonna have different icon and your IntelliSense and your coloring, text coloring is not gonna look the same. So you make sure you type in server.js. Okay, so what do we do in here? Well, it works pretty much the exact same way as it would do in C Sharp. So at the top, you would be using, um, for example, you'd be using Unity Engine. So you'd, you'd write the statement using Unity Engine. And then below that, you can start using stuff from Unity. Well, here is very similar. So we are going to start by tapping in const express is going to be equal to require express. What is happening over here is that I am requiring a package just like um, we mentioned a second ago. So if I'm using Unity, I'm going to do using Unity engine. But on top of that, I'm also taking what is inside of that package and I am storing it inside of a value. So a, a field, you could say um, here we would have a type in C sharp. Uh, but in JavaScript, there is no type. It's not a type safe language. So you could literally go down here and have a var, a normal var, right? Um, and that would be my number. And then you would assign it a number. But then after that, you could say, hey, uh, my number is actually equal to a string, any type of string. And that would work because it's not a type safe language. You can actually swap in between type in the middle if you wish. That being said, once we have the express package, we are going to try and log something out. Let's go ahead and try to log this one out. Now, how do I execute that code? Well, <laughs> that code is actually executed by going inside of the console. So here on this side, let me clear it up. Since we're trying to, um, since we're trying to run this with Node.js, we have to type in node and then the name of the file. Now there's only one in our folder. Well, there's two files, but only one of them that is JavaScript. So server.js. If I am to run this, the first problem we see is that we cannot find the module call express. Why is that? Well, it's because we, we haven't really installed express. It's not something that is built in Node.js by default. It's something we have to go and get ourselves. So if I am to actually do that, it looks something like this. So inside of my console, still inside of my terminal right here, I'm going to type in npm install dash dash save express. So what this does, I'm going to, I'm going to open up the package.json at the same time so you can see, but it's going to install a package called express and the dash dash save is to make sure it actually get stored inside of my package.json and it's being uh, treated as a dependency for the future. So as I run this, you're going to see we now have a dependency object within the JSON that says, hey, we're using Express version 4.17. Okay, so that's fairly cool. Let's go ahead and try to run our Node.js application once more. And if you guys remember, using the arrow key on the keyboard, I can just go up and up again, and up again, and up again, and up again. Okay, I wrote the whole thing, but node server.js is the one I'm looking for. Let's run this. And as you can see here, we got a bunch of information that we don't really care about, but um, we did the console.log and it worked quite well. So if I'm to replace express by a hello world, save this, run express again. So node server.js. Here it is. It says hello world in the console. So whatever we put in here is going to be output to the console. Very useful for the future, of course. All right. So as I mentioned, we're going to be using express to expose a port out of our machine and have different routes in which um, the, the person who joins, not joins, but the person who interacts with those routes will have some effect on our server. Um, to do so, we're going to create another field called application and we're going to say it's a express just like that. So we're going to construct the application through this and keep a reference inside of it. Now you can see this right here, the app here, you can see it as some sort of transport layer, just like we were doing it on Unity for multiplayer game. Um, so once we have that, we're going to type in listen. So application dot listen, the first parameter is, it says it's a callback, but I don't recall it being a callback Oh, here. So a port and then a callback. So the port would be something like, uh, I'm not sure. So let's go ahead and create ourselves a new field for that. Let's do one, three, seven, five, six, something like that. Grab the port, put it as the first parameter. And then the second parameter 
would be either a host name, which we are not going to have here. We're going to be using localhost. And even in the future, we're going to be using localhost as well. Um, we had a callback earlier. I just can't find it. Oh, there it is. So the callback. And just like we would write a lambda in C sharp, I'm going to do it the exact same way. So function is going to be equal to this. And then inside of here, we can do something once we are done. So this listen call over here might need to start up different processes, make sure everything is ready. And once it's ready, it's going to come back and run a console.log for us. Why not? And we're going to say listening on and then type in the port. Okay, let's go ahead and run this once more. As you can see here, it's really hard to see because I have to activate Windows, but we're listening on port 13756, which would mean that at this point, you can always head into any browser, type in the following. So the 127001, that's your local host. You can also just type in local host and then do two dot and the port. So 13756, I believe, hit enter. And as you can see here, it says cannot get with a dash, which right here, this is the route basically. And if you were to actually go anywhere else, as you can see, we cannot get this specific thing. So this is fairly cool because you might not have realized it, but we're actually connecting to something. Uh, if I am to like remove the server, if I'm to cancel the operation with the control C like so, and run this again, I, instead of getting a cannot get with the route, I will get a timeout. So as you can see, well, not a timeout, but a refuse to connect. So when we do that, we are actually connecting to something and it's the first step. Fairly cool. Now we're going to go ahead and declare ourselves a route. So to declare ourselves a route, let's go back in here and I'm going to go in between the declaration of the application and also in between the listen call. I'm going to come in here and type in routes. And I'm going to say app.get and then the route itself, we could do slash authentication. And here we are going to receive a callback, but this callback is going to be a function that is going to be called back with two parameters. So just like we've done earlier, this is a callback through a Lambda function, but here we receive two parameters. One of them is called the response. Another one is called the request. You could, of course, rename these inside of here for the full name. So response and request if you wish. But if you go on the web and you Google things a little bit, that's how everybody kind of do it. So you want to stick with what everybody else is doing in case you need some help on the Internet and you're posting your code. Um, one thing that I do is that I turn this function into a async function because later on, once we start working with the database, we're going to wait until the database is done with certain call before we move further. So. I like to put that on asynchronous. So this is just like declaring another function. Oh, and one thing that I've done wrong, and we have to correct this for sure, is that this is the request is first and then the response is second. Uh, we have to get the right order because when you get the, the message back, when you get the signature back, when this function is being called, it is going to put the wrong information here and the wrong information in there if it's not in the right order. So it's request first and then response. So with these two things in mind here, um, request is going to contain the information about how we've made the request. For example, when we visit the website through a get call, which would mean just visiting it uh, through what we've done here, this is a get, um, we would get information on that. If we had different parameters, for example, if we do question mark user is equal to me, then this now becomes part of the request. As you can see, it did not, it did not go somewhere else. So I can go to say user here and then press enter. I get to have user, but I don't get to have user is equal to me. This is because it's a parameter and you can have multiple parameter. You see that quite often, um, you know, in the web pages, this is part of the request. If we want information about what the person typed directly inside of the URL for the get for this example, we can find it within the request. So we can say console.log rec.parameters, I believe. And uh, it's going to give us those parameters. But one of the things that we are really interested in uh, here is not the request, though the request is going to be useful, but the response for today is the one we're going to be using. Because the response contains a callback called send. And within send, you can send in information back to the person who called it. So for example, hello world 
it is and then you can do something like date dot now and with this we're gonna go ahead and try our code once more so I'm gonna stop the console stop the server running that earlier with a control dot C and then do node server dot JS and just like that we're listening on one seven one three seven five six this number could be anything I just wanted to remind you and as I go here nothing changes why because the route is actually slash authentication so this code over here is only ran when I go inside of slash authentication so as you can see by doing that we now have the hello world it is and then that's the unix timestamp so if we are to refresh you're going to see it also changes with the time so that's like the big timer since a certain date that I don't quite remember um, and if you have a look over here on the console because we've done console.log this whole time we are right here we're receiving the parameter as well that we're sending but do note that here the URL is empty so we're not receiving anything but if we were to put something user ID for example and then my username we still don't get anything so hmm that's curious I wonder why okay so it's because it is the parameter and not the query so there's a small difference in between parameter and query I believe on top of my head is that parameter are the one that you don't see so for example when you go on a website and you fill in a form um, this goes inside of the parameter but if you put something here at the top in the URL this is part of the query so how did I find this out I actually found this out by outputting the whole request object over here which is quite big and I had to dig in but um, yeah if I'm interested in seeing what I write at the top here it would be query instead and as I reset this I can now reload my page and as you can see here my user ID is like mine and I can go down here and say page 2 and I receive a JSON object in which I can act upon in this piece of code here hello world instead of saying hello world let's just say my name right so we're gonna do rec.query.userid I believe that's the name that I give it yeah user ID like so Oh, and I have to reset my server, of course. npm, um, no, actually it's node server.js. And it says my name here instead. Now this is a very bad way to do things because you are opening yourself up to a lot of attacks. If you're writing directly, if you're writing stuff directly here in the dot send, you could say things like script and then run an alert if you wish. So something like that in the URL here for your user ID would actually be some JavaScript running and when I load up my page now I have an alert so that's not cool so of course we want to make sure we don't create anything that is going to open up um, our server to vulnerable events therefore I'm just going to remove this that, this thing that we had earlier just for the moment and we're going to keep on moving in in such a way that we are going to limit the amount of attack based on what I know um, I'm going to try and avoid all the pitfall but of course if you find anything let me know in the comment section down below now that's going to be it for today we had uh, we covered a lot of stuff and didn't write a lot of code but we covered a lot of stuff so i'm going to end this right here and in the next episode we're going to start looking at integrating the database so i will see you there cheers hey welcome to the third episode of the backend for the login project today we're going to be looking at uh, database stuff so we're going to be connecting our database through the node.js application we're also going to be saving stuff in there not in a secure fashion but i'll explain to you why and and what we do at that point and also what to do further if you want to enhance your security that being said we are first going to open up our project right as we do usually code dot here it is we have the server.js we have the node module that i didn't really explain where they come from they come from npm install so when you do npm install this actually pops on uh, as well now what we need to do today is integrate one new package i believe and that package is called mongoose what is mongoose mongoose is actually a um it's a package from npm and it helps you fetch information from a mongo db so it's called mongoose and has a lot of cool stuff that you can do with it um and it looks a little bit like that so when we connect we do a require mongoose which is going to be the package and then we send in a certain url 
with certain parameter and then we have access to stuff. So here we can say, hey, that's a new cat model and we can create it and then we can save it and we can do all that kind of stuff. And it's gonna work with the website that we uh, looked at earlier. So I'm gonna go ahead and copy this two line of code I have over here. You can just, um, you can just write them if you wish right here. So const mongoose, require mongoose. And if you guessed it, we don't have mongoose in our project right now. Why? Well, because we never really um, installed it. So I'm going to go ahead back in my console, do a npm install dash dash save mongoose like so. And it's going to go ahead and install the package that we need to interact with the database. So it's done. It's right here. And now we have to connect to a certain specific URL. Now that URL is not the one that we see here and we don't necessarily want to put it right there. So what I mean by that is I'd like to actually keep my, um, I actually like to keep the information such as the port and also the URL of the database, which is going to contain my password. I'd like to keep that somewhere far away from my Git. <laughs> so I don't want to be exposing that basically through my open source project. So what I'm going to do is right click, create a new folder that I'll call config. Inside of the config folder, I create a file called keys.js and inside of keys.js, um, I'm going to input some code that I have lying around somewhere. Just give me one second. And it's going to look like that. If my environment right now is in production, I'm going to include a file called production or just prod. And if it's not, I'm going to include a file called dev. Now, what we're going to do is inside of the same config folder, we're going to go ahead and create these two files. First one is called prod.js and the other one is called dev.js. Now, do note that we don't add the .js here. That's okay because it's it just gets interpreted that way. If there's nothing next to it, it's just going to grab the file as is and think it JavaScript in this case. And now what we're going to do is we're going to go inside of the production first and type in the following module.export and then an object. And that object is going to be an object containing a port and also a Mongo database URI. And as you can see here, it's actually set on the environment variable, which we don't have because we are not in production because we haven't made what well, we haven't set any environment variable, but that's actually where we will be putting our sensitive information in the future. When we are to put this in production, we're going to put it inside of environment variable that we can configure on Amazon web services on digital ocean, or just when we use a service like Docker. So that's where we're going to be putting them. It's the best, it's one of the best practice to is doing it this way. But right now I don't have any end variable and I just like to put it somewhere in plain text. This is why I have the dev.js. So I'm going to go ahead, grab this code, put it inside of dev.js, change the port for one, five, one, three, seven, five, six, I believe. I think that's what it was. And the Mongo URI, we're going to come back to it in just a second. And one thing that I'm going to do now, just to make sure that this is understood in, in a good fashion, um, we now store this information inside of the key.js. And then depending in which mode we are, are we in production or are we in development? We then branch out to a different file. So if I am in development, then it goes inside of here, grab these value. If I'm in production, it goes over here, grab the environment variable. But to have a reference to them, I have to uh, declare them here at the top of my server.js. So I'm going to say const keys is equal to require and I'm going to require config keys.js just like so. And then from that point on, we'll have access to keys and we can say keys.mongo URI. And for the port, we can just say keys.port, which will allow me to remove it from here as well. Okay. So this kind of goes against the whole setup that we've made here, because now our keys, they're still being exposed and they're still being exposed right here under the dev.js. This is a file that I don't want to see in my source control. So when I go ahead and I publish this later on to Git, I don't want to see this in my source control whatsoever. So what we can do is that we can ask Git to ignore some of these files. To do so, we create a new file with no name inside of it, but just an extension. So I don't put anything there, but dot git ignore. And just like that, you will see it has a certain specific icon that has to do with files that you will now 
ignore. So each line that you write will try to ignore something new. So for example, here, I want to ignore config um, dev.js. And as I save this, it should disappear, not disappear, but it should be not the same color. And it doesn't seem to do that right now. So let me just write this. Yeah. So that's going to work right here. Just config dev.js. As you can see, it goes to a gray color. And that means it is no longer being tracked by Git. On the same note, I'd like to ignore everything that is within the node module. Why? Because the node module is just, um, it's, it's a bunch of dependencies that you have to install every time that the project is, you don't know the project. So for example, this contains Mongoose, this contains Express, and all the depending, dependencies beneath that. And uh, they're quite heavy, right? So that's a lot of code in there. That's a lot of different stuff, that, as you can see. Um, I don't want to bring them with me with my project. All I need is actually a reference to what I need. So under the package.json, there is something here called dependencies. And when I hit npm install, it's going to go back and install all of these, reinstall all the node module you see there from a CDN. So from a content delivery network that I don't have to have, right? So I don't need this on my, um, on my Git. So I'm going to go ahead and say, I don't want the node modules either. And this is how we write it. Now, for some reason, the folder is still green. Maybe we're going to have to delete it completely and then push. Um, because this is already on the, on the service control. So maybe we don't want to do that here. Um, hmm. Before I actually go and I delete this folder and then I push the, uh, the delete, I'm going to wait until we're at the end of the episode so we can be in sync with um, the end of the episode. But the most important part here is that we now hide our development keys. And the production keys, well, they're hidden because you are going to only input them in the uh, environment variables. Okay. All right, so now we have this we need to get our Mongo URI. If we are to run this at the moment, we get a lot of error. First, Mongo parse error, the invalid connection string. That's because the connection string we use, the Mongo URI, is wrong and we need to fix that. How do we go about fixing this? Well, this is where we introduce the cluster that we've made earlier. So that cluster over here, we are gonna go under connect. We are gonna make sure we add our current IP address, actually, Allow access from anywhere would be a little bit better in this case. This is only if you want to whitelist some, some certain specific computer um, from accessing your database. But as I'm going to be testing this, I'm on localhost. I am on my own IP address, so I could be using that. But later on, we're going to take this and put it on a server somewhere on DigitalOcean or Amazon. So I'm going to go ahead and just allow anybody. But uh, if you want to be extra secure, then you want to whitelist only the computer you know will need access to your computer, um, to your database. Okay, next up, we're going to need a database user. I'm going to type in N3K, my password. I'll auto-generate one, grab it. Very important that you save it. You have to save both of these information and hit create. Okay, now with the password in mind, I am going to go back to my file my um, config file, which is right here. Just paste my password and also type in my username. So these two are going to be quite useful for making the Mongo URI. The next thing that we'll need from this is, let's see, I'm going to choose a connection method. And this is the one I am interested in over here. So I'm going to grab this link and I'm going to clean it up. I'm under Node.js version 3.6 or later. Um, grab this go back, paste it in, and we're going to clean it up. So that's my username. Okay, now my password needs to be replaced. So like this, the URL of the cluster has been um, assigned to me. So that's the one I want to keep. And here is the name of my database. And I want to keep actually I want to delete the rest here. How am I going to call my database? This is going to be my login game database where the sole purpose of the game is to log in. <laughs> um, with that in mind, grab the whole URI and this will now be your new URI. So now you understand why we have to hide this is because your database user isn't here and your database password isn't here. And then you have information on where to actually connect with these information. So delete the rest, we're going to give it a try. And we still get an uh, issue. So authentication failed. Hmm, let's find out why. 
so for some reason I was not able to connect, which I don't know why exactly, but I'm gonna go ahead and delete my old user, create myself a new database user, call it Epitom, create a new password, copy it, very important, I copy it, and hit add user. Now with this, I most likely am gonna have what I need, I believe, so I guess let's go back to my keys, change the, um, the password, this is a password over here with the new password, my new username is Epitome. There we go. Uh, I'm going to remove that like I've done earlier. And I'm going to go ahead and just try to connect this time. And for some reason now it did work. Um, I also made sure to console.logit. So while I was doing a little bit of debugging, I've added it in there. That's why you see it. But usually you don't see it. So if I am to save this again, go back. We are now connected to our database. It doesn't look like it, but we are. Okay. So that's really cool. Um, once you're connected to a database, we now have under the cluster here, we have a list of collection. Those collection are the equivalent of tables in SQL. So you have a certain model and that model will get filled it with, with information. In our case, we need a model for user account. So we're gonna go ahead and create ourselves a couple of new files. I'm gonna go here and create a new folder called model. And on their model, I'll create one that is called account.js. And I don't know why this one actually takes any capital letter. Um, when you look on the web, people tend to name their model with uh, a capital letter. So I'm gonna go ahead and do the same exact thing. And we're gonna go ahead and define a model for account. So we first have to start with a mongoose call. So we're gonna require a mongoose, just like we've done in the previous page, but we need it in this, in this script as well here. So require a mongoose. We don't need to install it because it's already part of the project. Um, and we're also going to retrieve schema outside of mongoose, like so. So this is a deconstructor. What basically it does is that it, it actually stored this value called schema uh, inside of a field. But you could also access it through mongoose.schema. So it's kind of a way to retrieve this we put it in there. And the reason that uh, it works is because it matches the exact same name of the, as the object inside of the right hand side of the operation. So when you deconstruct something, you grab the, um, the children object of the one on the right, and they have to match the exact same name. So schema is there. And now we're going to declare ourselves the account. So account schema. And this is now something that we define. We create a new schema. And we go ahead, put it on another line like so. Do note that I've uh, opened a set of parentheses, but also a set of objects, you could say, or curly braces. <laughs> uh, and we're going to go ahead and input, say, a username. And that username is going to be type of string and a password, which is also going to be type of string. We are going to go at bottom and also write in something like last authentication which is going to be type of date. Okay, so a uh, quick tangent. I am not going to encrypt the password. I'm not going to salt the password. I'm not going to be using bcrypt. I'm not going to be using Aragon2. I'm not going to be using anything to hide the password. At the moment, what I'm trying to do is just show you how to get this thing off the ground, but this is not a secure way to do it. I want to emphasize that when you go to production, you're going to have to store your password in a much better fashion. Um, it is outside of the scope of this. It's actually a topic that is a bit complex. So what I want to do is refer you to the OWASP, which is the Open Web Authentication Secure something. Um, I'm probably getting that wrong, but there is certain ways to hide your password. And it's very important that you do so because if your database get hacked and you leak user password in plain text, there's no, there's no coming back from that. And this link right here will be in the description. It's a good place to start just reading, informing yourself. You're going to find a lot of example online on how to encrypt your password with a salt on top of it. I would recommend looking up a guide for using this with Aragon2, which is the, um, right now it's the leading algorithm um, for password encryption because it's, it's harder to, uh, to brute force than any of the others at the moment as of 2021 June. All right, so we're back from the tangent. We now have a account schema. 
we have a definition of what an account could be, like a model of an account. This is what it should look like. Now we have to register it within Mongoose. So when we use it a little bit later on during our project and we say, hey, we'd like to have a new account, he knows that a new account consists of a username, password, and a last authentication date. To do so, we type in mongoose.model and we set a name for this. The name is going to be accounts and the schema we have to register is the account schema, just like so. Cool. Now, one of the problem we have with this is we have no way of actually knowing what the model is because all we do is we run server.js and by running server.js, yes, you do connect to the database, you do have your routes, but we never run this specific code. So what we have to do is go here. I would do it at the very top where we set up the, um, the database. So this would be like setting up DB. Uh, once we're connected, let's go ahead and set up our model. Set up database models. And to do so, it's very simple. Require and we require model and account. And just by requiring this, just by having this, this using statement, you could say, is going to run this code. And by running this code, we will register inside of the mongoose.model database, you could say. All right, now we have a definition of what a game account is. It's time to go ahead and start um, interacting with the database, but using our server, using Node.js instead. So we're going to go back in the same route, right? So this route over here, instead of calling it authentication, I'll call it account for the moment. And what I want to do is remove all of that that I had earlier and start looking for some information. First, what I'll do is I'll deconstruct, just like we've deconstruct over here, I am going to deconstruct the query. So what I'm deconstructing is this query to have some specific element in the URL that one of them is going to be the username and the other one is going to be the password. Just to make sure we're on the same track here, I'm going to go ahead and do a console.log, say username, another one for password, and res.send, just a small hello, just for testing out purpose, right? So what happens over here is as I am running the server, so the Node.js server, if I go on localhost 13756 so let's do localhost 13756 slash account this happens we get the hello of course but then we get undefined and undefined because what i'm doing is i am deconstructing the re uh, the request.query and we saw in the last episode i believe that the query is the parameter you get in the URL. So going back here, if I am to introduce a new parameter, so um, hello is equal to Dave, we now have something within query. So here it is. You don't see it because the name of my parameter is hello in this case. So if I were to go here and say hello and also output that, refresh the server as you can see we get Dave because now we get the parameter but what we want to do here is say username is equal to for example my username and then add another parameter called password and say it's going to be equal to one two three four five and with this we now get the two information that we want I wanted to show that just to show you how the, the, um, the constructor worked so these fields, they're now populated, but only when we, uh, when we send in information through the query. This is not how we're going to do it in the end game. I'm just telling you now, this is just so we can get things off the ground. In the future, we're not going to be using uh, parameters in the URL. Instead, we're going to be using uh, parameters through forms or um, URL encoded parameters. And we're also going to be using the post protocol as well, but not now. Okay. So the first thing we do once we have the username and password is we're just going to check if any of these are null. So if username is equal to null or password is equal equal to null, then I'm going to do, well, first let's um, do, 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 return a message. So send return dot send invalid credentials. And then I'm going to hit return here. 
So if one of these two is not filled in, I'm just going to say invalid credentials. That's a good start. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to find any account that already exists with that username, see if that is possible. To do so, I'm going to need a reference to my model. So here we have the setup database model. Now it's time to actually use them. And to use them, we have to declare a new const value that I called const account mongoose.model account, like so. And this could not be over here. This has to be beneath the require call because we have to register it first before we get a reference to it. So just like so, we now have a reference to account. And with this, we are pretty much open to do anything we wish with that specific model in the database. Have a look. So we're going to say we are going to declare a new variable called um, user account. That's the one we should be returning. And we're going to say account dot find one, which is a function in MongoDB. And here you receive it's just like um, a, a find with a link queue. So you go ahead and you declare the name of your object. I'm just going to call it X. And we're going to say X dot username is equal to equal to username, just like so. So what happens over here is that it goes through all the account, puts them under X. And then if the username matches the username um, field that we have here, which we deconstruct. So that's the one from the query, then it's going to put it inside of user account. Now, in case the, that is null, so if username is equal equal to null, we're going to have to create a new account, which we could also output down here and say, create new account, dot, 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 or attempting to create, it might fail. So <laughs> we are going to try and create a new account. Um, and if that's the case, we have to do the following, declare a new account. We're going to say new account, like so, open the curly brace instead of um, inside of the parentheses. And we're going to say username is equal to username. Password is going to be equal to password. And last authentication, I believe we call it last authentication date or just last authentication. Last authentication like this. Oh, and I do is equal. I shouldn't do the is equal. I should do the, the two signs, my bad. Sometimes I get confused in between the languages, but uh, yeah. Um, date dot now. Okay. And that's going to be our new account. Now, remember, I actually wanted this to be uh, asynchronous. That's because I wanted to be able to do an await statement. So I'm going to wait until the new account has been saved within the database, just like so. So with this, it should now be saved. And once that is completed, I'm going to return that send the new account only once it has been saved, then hit return. Okay. So if there is an existing account, it's actually, if there is no existing account, it's going to create one and send the information back to me, which is uh, fairly cool. Now, if there is an existing account, what I'm going to do is the following. So in the else statement, if we're able to find a match with the username, I'm going to check if you have the right password, right? So if my password is equal equal to user account dot password, then here we have the right information and we can proceed. Now, obviously, before you flipped out, this is not how you would do it in production. As I said, this should not just be a password. This should get hashed and salt and stored inside a database in an encrypted fashion. Everybody should have a different salt. Everybody should have, uh, yeah, different salt, basically. Um, and you should be using Aragon too, if you wish to do all the encryption. So something very, very secure. But right now, we're just doing it for show. We're just making sure that you know we have the basic authentication flow going. But if you're going to put that in production, I want you to come back and change this thing because it would be irresponsible to do it like this. OK, tangent is over. If the password is correct, then I'm going to go ahead and say we're going to return the user account. But before we do that, because we're authenticating, I'm going to go ahead and say, you know this user account? Let's actually change the last authentication to date.now and then go ahead and save it. So await user account save. Actually here, I don't actually need to wait because hmm, I don't need to wait for the person like the information. It can go in parallel. I don't mind if the last authentication date is not set before I receive the message. Uh, 
I don't know, actually. I'm going to keep it there, but you could you could definitely have these things in parallel. They don't depend on each other is what I'm trying to say. Okay, so with this piece of code in mind, let's give it a try, right? So I'm going to go ahead, close my server, open it up, and I'm going to hit refresh. What happened? So unhandled error. Cannot read username of null. This would be on line 24. Let's find line 24. So my error actually comes from here. Uh, it's because I wrote it the same exact way as I would write the link queue uh, query. It's not like that, unfortunately. I forgot. Things have to be done in another fashion. So by sending an object, and I'm going to say username is equal to username, I guess. That would be it. Yeah, because you're trying to find it where username matches the parameter on the right. So it would be username here as well. So that being said, boot it up once more. Let's see what goes on. Refresh. And I'm waiting. It seems like I am getting somewhere with no response return, which is weird. Um, let's find out where that is. So I'm not going through this flow over here and I'm not going through this flow over here for some reason. So we're stuck somewhere. I just don't know where exactly. Um, did we get, we didn't get the message for create a new account. So technically username was not null. Hmm. Because I want to check for user account, not username. My bad. This is very bad. And so I, I wrote code a little bit too fast. Let's go ahead and delete that. Um, restart the server. Try it again. And it seems like once more I am receiving a timeout, which means I'm going to shut off my server and just have a look at what could be wrong in here. Um, I don't like the fact that I'm having the same thing here for the model and also the parameters. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to add a small R in between for request username and also request password. And just change these around so we don't get any uh, infinite loop for some reason. I don't know why it would be the case, but might as well do that. So do we have any more of these? No, it seems to be good now. Um, let's go ahead and run this. So node server.js. Okay, I receive the invalid credentials. So at least I'm receiving something which is quite good. I'm going to have a look at my uh, MongoDB Atlas. And here I don't get anything. So there was nothing input inside of the login test database. Yep, yeah, so let's have a look. Invalid credentials, where could that lead us? Over here, so our username, oh, okay. So I've changed the name of my, um, that's my problem here. Since I've changed the name of the thing inside of the query, I don't get those anymore without changing it here as well. So I'm gonna say our password and our username, then go through here. Okay, so password is not defined and this is on line 40. So here, our password is not defined. Let's do it. Oops. Let's go ahead and restart this once more. It's out of trial and error, but we'll get through it eventually. Um, and one thing that was cool is that since we made it that far, it would mean that it found an account. Now, how did it find an account? I'm not quite sure. So user account had to be null which confuses me here because we didn't find anything in there, did we? Let's see, so under collection. So it seemed like we are not getting inside of that flow. Instead, we're getting inside of the else flow and then inside of here, then nothing really happens because we we just, you know, we don't match on the password because there's no user account. So what I'm gonna do is go at the end here and just input the same thing as we had earlier, invalid credential, which at least is going to now when we run the server, we're going to receive a invalid credentials. Um, since we tested it in such a way earlier that we know we went inside of here, we also know that user account was not equal to null for some reason. So I'm just curious to see what is inside of here. So I'm going to do user account console.log. Sorry about the cops. And log this. So it seems like we receive something. We receive a query which is quite weird. And I just remember one crucial thing. Um, 
that I've mentioned earlier, but I totally forgot now. When I'm doing operation with the database, it's something that goes externally, fetch information and then comes back. So I can't just run the code in a linear fashion. I really have to stop and wait for things to come back to me. So here when I do account.find1, all I'm getting is a promise that I'll receive information in the future. But if I await that, then my promise becomes fulfilled and now I now have the right object. So the reason we were having so much trouble earlier is because I did not wait for the response back from the database, which would mean that now if I am to run this once more, and as you can see, I have the, the console.log on that specific user. If we give it back, um, what happened? Create new account, but then we got this information here instead of getting the, uh, the whole thing here, the whole query at the top. So we're one step further. I can now remove this. I want to refresh, see what happens. It's still creating new accounts. Is it creating new accounts? Because the last authentication date is actually, it doesn't seem to move here. So it says create new account, but it's getting the same information as before. So does that mean I can go back to saying if this is equal to null? And yes, okay, so that worked now. It took a little bit of effort. It's time to clean up the code. So if user account is equal to null, we go ahead and we create a new one, else we're going to go ahead and retrieve an existing account. That being said, let's give it a good try. Uh, I just cleaned up the code, boot up the server. I'm gonna go inside of the Atlas, refresh my page, and I'm gonna delete every single account that exists over there. And you can do so by hitting the delete collection. Let's drop. Now we have a clean database and let's see what happens if I have to refresh this page. Initially, I'm creating a new account. And as you can see, if I refresh this page, it's gonna be right here with the last authentication date with my username and my password. If I am to refresh, it's retrieving an existing account. So again, if I refresh this time, we don't get to have two of those. However, we got the date um, change. Technically, that should have worked. <laughs> And what if I am to input a wrong password? So let me add a couple of digits. I am getting a invalid credentials and nothing happens. So we are one step closer to making this work with Unity, but we still have a little bit of work to do on the back end before we do that. So we're actually going to wrap up this episode for today. I am running out of voice. And what I want to say is that things are not going to remain the way they are right now, but we're gonna change things a little bit in the future to make sure that one, we don't go um, and send a username password through the query. Instead, we're going to send them through a post. And then we're going to do that from Unity instead of doing that from our browser. So everything that is inside of the browser, what we're doing right now, is not going to be part of the project towards the end. But right now, we're using it for testing. We're using it to make sure things work. We have a database right now that stores information. We still don't put any game information in it, but we're just a couple of lines away from doing that if we go inside of our model. And um, yeah, so let's wrap it up for today and I'll see you guys very soon. Cheers. Hey guys, welcome back to the last video of the backend. Uh, this is the final one before we go inside of Unity and start getting things done. We are gonna start today by opening up a git bash or any terminal and go under the proper directory. So that's the directory we did pretty much the whole project in. And we're going to install a new package that is called nodemon, just like this. And instead of doing dash dash save like we've done earlier, instead we're gonna do dash dash save dash dev. So what we're gonna be doing here is installing a development only dependency that is called nodemon. And nodemon is actually a package that is going to reboot the server as soon as there is one change. So earlier we were saying node server.js when we wanted to run something and it seems like it doesn't work right now. Oh, I think I wiped my key. Yes, I wiped my key. So I'm going to have to go get that back. I'll be back in a second. And here it is back. So since I'm not saving this through Git, obviously we're not pushing that to the server. And me personally, when I work on these, on these projects, um, I usually have a branch in where I develop my thing and then a branch in which um, I make it through the video, right? So this is a second branch in which I redo pretty much the same thing I've done before. So when I switch in between branch, I actually lose this, which is quite annoying for me. But in your case, if you're not resetting or if you're not getting the project 
uh, the fresh project from GitLab or GitHub, you should not run into this problem, but of course, it's a good practice to save this somewhere as a backup. All right, so what I wanted to do now is run the server first, see if everything still works, right? So let's do node server.js. And just like that, we get the same result as before. We're going to cancel it out with the control C. And now this time, we're going to try and run it with nodemon instead. So nodemon server.js. And it seems like in my case here, nodemon isn't found, even though we've just installed it. So what I can do is go through the local folder, call it npx nodemon server.js. And here you will see it works. Now, node one is just exactly the same thing as node. So it runs a server, but as soon as it detects a change within the folder, it is going to rerun the server. So we don't have to kill it every time and then, you know, restart it. Maybe it's something we should have done a little bit earlier, but at the same time, you know, as long as we get it in, that's perfect. So here, uh, let me give you an example. I'm just going to remove one space, hit save. And you're going to see here it's restarting because it found changes. And then it's now listening back on the same port. So this is what nodemon does. Now to integrate this a little bit further, we're going to go inside of the package.json. And inside of the package.json here, uh, we have a section for script. So when you make a node.js project, usually you don't start it exactly the same way as I used to. So we, we did node server to JS, but the reality is that you like to fire, what, what people do online is that they fire a script that will then run this command in case in the future you want to run additional command. Let me give you an example here. So what I can do here on the script is go here and say, I want to create a script called dev. And then the script is basically just a line of code, right? So a, a line of code that usually goes inside of the command line. So here, when I want to boot up uh, dev, I could say node server.js, like so. And by doing that, if I go inside of here and I say npm run dev, then node.js, node server.js here is being run. And that's really cool because in the future, you can keep on using npm run dev, but you can change the content of it in case something changes. Like in our case right now, we're no longer using node server.js. Instead, we're using npx nodemon server.js, which is quite cool because now with the same command, we are now running nodemon. Uh, it's actually used quite a, like quite a lot um, for things such as here, I want to run production instead. So here you would have maybe a build this thing and then launch a server on port environment, whatever, right? So you can put as much information as you want in there and you just have to call npm run dev, npm run start, npm run build maybe if you want to have another line of, uh, of code that would build your project and send it over through SCP or something like that. So I'm going to stick with that. We now have npm run dev and with that this is going to launch our server with nodemon um, since we've only saved nodemon as a dev dependency when we are to run this in production so here production we're not going to use nodemon nodemon is not going to exist in um, a production environment so here it's just going to be node server.js for the moment if we need to change it we can definitely change it in the future okay so one more thing i wanted to do before we go any further is I wanted to clean up the server.js. So over here, we have the server.js. We have most of our thing here at the top, setting up the database, uh, requiring the accounts and the model actually. So the database model. And here we say, okay, so account is equal to that. What I'd like to do instead is grab everything related to routes. And you know, it takes a big, big amount of space here. I want to take all of that and put it in a different folder. So what I'm going to do is create a new folder, call it routes. And here we're going to say this is the authentication routes.js. So I've just created myself a new file and I'm going to go ahead, take everything that we have regarding routes, including account here, because that's a reference that we use inside of the routes. So taking all of that, I'm going to cut it and go inside of my new file and paste it for the moment. Will not work as of right now. We need to do a little bit of changes, but stick with me. For these routes to be registered, we are going to need a reference to the app over here. And this uh, this app is actually our express object. Um, to make this work, we are going to wrap this whole thing up. So not, not the reference here at the top, but this whole thing up. We're going to wrap it inside of a module.exports, like so. And we're going to say it's equal to app, and then open up the Lambda function 
reopen up some braces and just wrap everything within this. So it looks like that. When we now do a require on this very specific object here, we now have a function that we can call with a specific parameter, in this case app, and then this is being run inside of it. I'll admit that it's a little bit complex to understand when you don't do JavaScript too often, but stick with me for this one, it's actually quite powerful. So with that in mind, I just realized we're also going to need mongoose here because we're calling mongoose, but there's no reference. So I'm just going to quickly grab mongoose, go back to my file. And I have to declare this before, of course, before I get the reference to account because account uses mongoose. Okay. Um, and then at this point, we're going to go back to where we were with that code, which is right here and just say set up the routes. And here we will do a require on the route folder authentication route and then in braces here we are going to send in a reference to the application just like that let's see if this actually worked well this whole time we we're doing changes of course node mon was running so we got a bunch of different things and we're gonna go see if we broke so what goes on here am i on the right port i might not be on the right port so this is port 13756 and the routes is under account over here so 13756 and account invalid credentials Obviously, we don't have the right credentials. We didn't send any credentials, so that's perfect. Oh, by the way, here's a note, right? Um, it's going to sound a little bit stupid. It's just a tangent again, but it's a security tangent, and I want to tell you these things, right? So I'll give you an example. If you are a attacker and you're trying to force find the account of someone and you don't know the username and the password, you never want to reveal to the person that he landed on the username. You see it sometimes when you want to recover your your password from certain specific website. They say, enter your email address here and it will send you a password um, reset request, right? So you enter your email and they don't tell you if it worked or not. They just tell you if there was an email, we've sent something to it. They don't let you know that, hey, you found an email that exists within our database. And, you know, if you want to pursue attacking someone with that email, then you know that the account they're using is through that email. So instead of saying things like, hey, we didn't find your username in database, you want to say just invalid credentials. Um, if it's a password that doesn't match, but you have a username, you don't want to let them know that they landed on the username. You just want to tell them, you know, that that combination of the two, they, it doesn't work. So I can't do anything with that. You never want to reveal too much information with your, with your logs when you send back information, which is why I'm using the same statement here, invalid credential and here as well. Um, now granted that the flow here we're using for authentication is quite bad because we create an account if there's you know if there's no account there we create an account it's a very very minimal way to do things you could say um, but it's not secure at all right so usually what you want to do is have a screen for creating an account and have another screen for I uh, just login in but in this case if we don't find any account we do log in um, but I hope you understood my tangent thank you Okay. All right. So now where was I? Yes, we were just, uh, we know that this works. We know that uh, we've, we've made some changes and our server.js is now much cleaner, which is quite cool. So in the future, if you want to have multiple models, if you want to have a model, for example, for a game account or for a character in your game that is assigned to a specific account, you can just stack them right here and you have multiple routes. Of course, you can stack them um, right there beneath this. So that's cleaned up and now things are a little bit more split apart, which is cool. All right. So with these changes, I want to wrap up the, um, the fourth episode, which I think is going to all going to be wrapped up in a single episode on YouTube. Uh, but I want to wrap up this very specific video for the sole purpose that we have something that works. It's very minimal. It's poorly done in terms of security. And I'm going to admit that out straight. That's perfectly fine. Why am I fine with this? Because I want to start um, testing out stuff with Unity. So we're going to go inside of Unity. We're going to do a request on that server. If everything works well, we are then going to first get our mechanic to work. And then on top of that, once these two are connected together, we're going to go back in this project, change the route to a post route, make sure we hide the password. We at least, we at least encrypt it to a minimum <laughs> and, um, and just make things a little bit better. But first I want to make sure that we can go on unity, connect to this, have everything work. So here's the structure I'm thinking about. First, we're going to have the backend video. We're going to have a video with multiple parts for 
the uh, Unity front end, and then we're going to come back and polish this. What I want to make sure that you do, if you haven't done it already, is publish your code on your source control, right? So here, that's the thing on top of my face, I'm sorry about that. I'm going to do a git status, and on that git status, I see that there's a couple of changes. I want to add all of these change, so git add dot. I'm going to comment this as episode 4. And of course, push it. So, so if you're working on this project right now and you're stuck somewhere and you want to follow step by step, I do invite you to go directly on the project. I made sure to make a um, make a comment every time that I finished recording one of these episodes. So basically, here you can see that the last comment for this one was episode three, two, and so on. And of course, I'd like you to stay under the master branch because that's where I actually do the videos. And I, the dev branch is there. It's going to be deleted eventually. That's just when I, I try out stuff before I record the video. So with that in mind, we are going to wrap up this very first section. And as I mentioned, it's not, it's not the best. It's not pretty, but it's going to work. And we're going to go inside of Unity, connect things together, and then come back, clean things up, publish it live so everybody can have something clean. Thank you so much for watching, and I will see you in the Unity section. Cheers.